Hi everyone, we are fifth year medical students and we'll be taking you through the examination of the hip. As with all things medicine, remember to take a thorough history before doing your examination. We will be following the same structure that we follow with all other orthopedic examinations. So, we will be assessing the joint above and below, the neurovascular assessment of the limb, we will also be looking, feeling and lastly we are going to move. We would like to encourage you to revise your anatomy and also look at the different planes of movement in various joints. As the patient walks into the examination room, it's important to observe how they are walking, which essentially means doing a gait analysis. It's important to know especially about Trendelenburg gait. And then the short limb gait. And lastly, the antalgic gait. Ensure adequate exposure of the joint that you're going to examine. Note the normal posture of the spine. Look for kyphosis, scoliosis, and from the side, look for nodosis. Also, check closer to the joint for symmetry, muscle wasting. Check that the pelvis is normal as opposed to tilted to the one side. Check that the hips side in normal position and not flexed, adducted, or adducted. Also check for scarring or any swelling. From the front, again assess for symmetry, muscle wasting, scars, swelling. Look that the pelvis is in a normal position as opposed to tilted to the one side. Check that the hips are in a normal position. Check that the legs are in neutral position and that the knee is not in a varus or vulgus angulation. Also check that the knee is not flexed to compensate for a leg length discrepancy. Feel. So we're going to feel for local tenderness over the greater trochanter, directly over the joint, over the pubic symphysis and the sacroiliac joints. We're also going to feel for lymphadenopathy in the groin and assess the femoral pulses and be sure to do this on both sides. We're then going to move to look at leg length discrepancy. So, we need to ensure that the iliac crests are perpendicular to the long axis of the trunk if we want to assess true leg length discrepancy. We're going to identify the anterior superior iliac spines and the medial malleolus of both legs and measure and make sure that both sides are equal. For apparent leg length discrepancy, we're going to measure from the ziphi sternum to the one medial malleolus and then from the ziphi sternum to the other medial malleolus. Should there be a length discrepancy, we would know that it could be either suprapelvic because of a scoliosis, infrapelvic because of hip abduction or adduction, or a fixed flexion deformity. It could also be pelvic because of a pelvic obliquity. We will then move to the Gagliardi test, which will help us identify whether the shortening is from the femur or from the tibia. Flex both knees to 90 degrees and with the ankles together, look at whether there is shortening superiorly, which will tell us that the problem is within the tibia. And then look at whether the shortening is anteriorly, which will tell us that the problem is with the femur. Having done this, we will then progress to Bright's triangle, which will help us assess if the problem is above or below the greater trochanter. Place your index finger on the anterior superior iliac spine and your thumb on the greater trochanter. Draw a horizontal line from the anterior superior iliac spine and a vertical line from the greater trochanter and look at where these lines intersect. If the shortening is above the greater trochanter, the triangle will be smaller on that particular side. And now it's time to move the joint. When assessing the range of movement, we know that we can move it actively and passively. If passive movement is more than active movement, we know that there is an extra articular problem, for example, a muscle problem. If we have decreased range of movement, both passively and actively, we know that it's an articular problem such as osteoarthritis. We are now going to start with flexion. With the knee 
at 90 degrees and the hand under the lumbar spine flex the hip. Normal flexion is about it's up to 120 degrees and we will compare both sides. We'll now move on to abduction and adduction. We will identify the anterior superior iliac spine and place our hand over it to stabilize the pelvis. We will abduct to about 40 degrees which is normal but we will know that we have reached our full range of movement when the pelvis starts to lift. With adduction we know that the normal is up to about 30 degrees but we will know that we've reached our full range of movement when the pelvis starts to lift. We will do this on both sides. We will then move on to internal and external rotation. With the knees flex to 90 degrees, we will then flex the hips separately. All right. At this point, we will do our internal rotation. And the normal internal rotation is about 45 degrees. And then we will do our external rotation, which is also supposed to be up to 45 degrees. We will then move on to our special test, which is the Thomas test. The Thomas test will help us identify a fixed flexion deformity, but it will also tell us whether the hip is able to fully extend or not. With the knees flexed to 90 degrees, the contralateral hip is flexed and held onto. Then we will extend the other leg and make sure that it goes all the way down. If it doesn't go all the way down, we know that we have a fixed flexion deformity. And that brings us to the end of our hip examination. We hope that this was a useful resource for you and all the best with your studies.